Many times we see people undertaking a religious appearance in order to appease those that they live among, but it's not really a service from their hearts. Whatever the primary faith is within a given geographic area, such is what the people will adopt, whether or not they actually believe it. This they do to keep the peace and to live and work without harassment. Not such a bad idea, I guess. Often this comes for the sake of family relations, the pressure from a person's family to conform to the religion which most of them follow. But Jesus warned us of this in Matthew chapter 10, saying that those who love other family members more than him are not worthy of him, and that we must forsake all to become his disciples. So there are some who become Christian because all of their friends are, or that it gives them something to do on a Sunday. For most people, if it was just a matter of their own relationship with God directly, it wouldn't really sway them. Jesus said that those who would worship the Father must do so in spirit and in truth, and not with phony pretenses designed to please others. Nebuchadnezzar tried to unite his empire through the worship of an immense idol that came from his own mind, but there were three servants of God at the dedication ceremony for which this event did not sit well. Now, most of us know well the story from Daniel chapter 3 and the disruption that was caused by Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego when they refused to bow to the king's idol. Yet there still must have been at least many hundreds, if not thousands of people present who had readily accepted the king's command. And I ask you, why did they bow down so easily? My point is that they were glad to adopt the king's new religion in order to save themselves. It was of no concern to the king if they were worshiping in truth, but to the real and living God, it matters very much. But we see this principle applied openly by the Assyrians in 2 Kings chapter 17. For when they first took over the cities in Samaria, the Lord sent lions among them, and some were killed. They saw this as a curse from God, and they weren't familiar with this God in Samaria and how to serve him. Yet when they began setting themselves to be free of this curse, they did it only in the most superficial of ways, for they still put their idols in the places where the Samaritans had worshipped the real God, and they even were sacrificing some of their children into the fire for the offerings of their ceremonies that they did. We find some chilling verses in this chapter that reveal the following. And this would be in verses 33 and 34 of 2 Kings 17. They feared the Lord and served their own gods after the manner of the nations whom they carried away from there. Unto this day they do after the former manners. They fear not the Lord, neither do they after their statutes or after their ordinances or after the law and commandment which the Lord commanded the children of Jacob. It concludes in verse 41, So these nations feared the Lord and served their graven images, both their children and their children's children, as did their fathers, so do they unto this day do. God is one of those others that some make a pretense of pleasing, and it goes hand in hand with pleasing people who will approve of you as being one of their own faith. But to be real, it must come from our spirit within and in truth. This Bible episode looks so much like what we've been seeing all around us of late, as many are trying to claim genuine faith in Christ without ever fully surrendering their lives to him. Did the Assyrians actually fear the Lord in truth? Sure doesn't look that way. In the book of Esther also, it is written that many of the people of the land became Jews for the fear of the Jews they had. Now such a fear would not reflect or bring about a true godly obedience our Lord is searching for in us. How many of those we know are only pretending to be saved for purposes unknown? Or how many are deceived within themselves about their relationship with God? The Bible says that we should test the spirits and to know them by their fruits, both for our good and for theirs, we've got to warn them. We owe it to ourselves and those surrounding us to walk after the Spirit of God with ever-increasing discernment. Remember, our sure but challenging instruction is to reprove, rebuke, and exhort with long-suffering and doctrine, because today sound doctrine has been laid aside for teachings that please our ears. Time is really getting short, brethren, so let's be about this critical business our Father has for us. Check the description below for the related scriptures. May God bless.